goodness gracious me. Well, thank you, Owen, for such a warm welcome, and thank you, Science Gallery, for having me here. Um, the talk at Dublink, at the Dublink launch this morning, uh, was a, an opportunity for us to discuss the, the potential benefits, the opportunities in, uh, in the interaction between cities and data. And I'm afraid that the talk I'm going to give to you this afternoon is, uh, is the, the flip side of the coin. Uh, and I don't want to spook anybody, but it's definitely uh, the, the purpose of this particular talk is to articulate a spectrum of concern. Uh, around the collection of data from public space and how the, the instrumented networked city might be transforming our notions of public space, how we can use it and what is done there. Um, Owen has already very ably introduced myself, so I'm going to skip all this material as somewhat less than relevant. Um, he kindly mentioned my book. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Um, but here's where I want to get to. I, I want to get to the idea that networked urbanism, uh, as we think of it, is very much a live, contentious, open, active field of inquiry. Uh, the reason I put the, the question mark here is because when we speak of networked urbanism, as we do at my practice at Urban Scale, uh, we leave open the question as to, as to exactly what we mean by that. What we're discovering is that the network city is different in every urban terrain on earth. The network city is different to every person who encounters it. The network city is there for interpretation, active recreation, um, and, and is very much a live and open-ended issue. So I, I never want to say or, or argue that there is such a thing, a domain, a body, a discourse of knowledge as networked urbanism. I do want to say, however, that we have networked cities. And one of the things that I cannot help but notice about this is that uh, despite the efforts of organizations like IBM and Cisco and Intel, who are sort of constantly offering us these visions of smart cities that always seem to live somewhere in the proximate future, um, I would argue that we already live in the networked city. And very often, it looks like this. Very often, it's, it's something that's rife with new failure modes that, that ultimately wind up detracting from the experience of public space. Um, this actually is an image. Does anybody recognize where this is? Uh, this is this is in the Flatiron Building in New York uh, at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 23rd Street. Um, it is one of the most desirable, most expensive pieces of commercial property in the city of New York. And so what we're seeing here really is a failure on many levels. I mean, it, it, this was I think of it as a quadruple failure. Uh, it is obviously a failure on the part of Sprint, the, the people who are paying for uh, this very expensive property to, to be used as a commercial display. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're an ordinary, not particularly technically inclined person and you pass by and you see this image, uh, you may be inclined to regard it as a failure on the part of Samsung, because Samsung's logo is, after all, directly beneath the monitor that's crashed. And if you don't know that much about technology, you'll be inclined to say, well, Samsung just doesn't make a very reliable product now, do they? Um, if you know a little bit more about technology than that, of course, you'll recognize the particular device uh, that's failed as, a, as a, a, an offering of the Microsoft Corporation that we know as Windows. Uh, and, and so here already are three parties that have lost in this not particularly well thought out introduction of network systems into, into the city. But there's a fourth register of loss. There's a fourth register of value that, that is slipping out of the equation, out of the framework here. And that is, of course, the, the citizenry and the people walking by and the people using the city of New York. I particularly myself have reservations about the intensive commercialization of public space. Nevertheless, it's always been part of New York's identity, and particularly certain intersections, that there be a certain exuberance that's driven very much by, by intense visual advertising. And uh, whatever else might have been in that window, I think we can agree that it was probably of more value, more potential interest to people walking by than this crash screen, this default screen that we see here. So this particular instantiation of networked information processing and display in the city um, isn't really working very well. And that's one of the reasons why I want to get in, begin interrogating these instantiations, these installations, these appearances of ubiquitous computing and, and networked artifacts. Now, I, I think it's also important to point out that we are the smart city to the degree that it exists. Um, just about everywhere you go on Earth, you'll find that uh, there's a pervasively, even a comprehensively instrumented population. Uh, we are already well on the way to uh, a smartphone, a networked computing object sensor platform that lives in your pocket that functions as an aperture onto the network and everything that it can do 
uh, with a bill of materials on the order of 20 euros. I mean, we're, we're getting that close to making the promise and the, and, and the potential of these devices literally that universal, even in you know, the developed, uh, in the developing world, in, in the emerging markets, in the places that are ordinarily not thought of as being particularly well instrumented. We, in essence, are the instrumentation platform. We also find that the city is characterized, uh, the, the physical fabric of our places are increasingly made up of objects, discrete objects that are capable of gathering, processing, displaying, transmitting, and, and taking physical action on information. And what this implies as well is, is that uh, the city is now characterized by new modes of surveillance uh, that don't always or even necessarily operate in the visual register. So for a lot of us, our, our intuitive image of surveillance is a CCTV camera, is that sense of being watched. Um, most of the new instrumentation, most of the new sensors have some visual component, but a lot of them do not as well. We're talking about things like load cells, um, things like microphones, uh, things at CO2 sensors. Uh, increasingly, the ability to do inferential analysis on these things and even predictive analysis as well as uh, the, the declarative media that we now use and which sentiment analysis is being conducted on. So when you Twitter in a particular place and there's a place stamp, a location marker that's associated with that utterance, and that utterance has words that have some kind of emotional balance or register to it, increasingly we can look at those, th that, that stream of, of Twitterings and say, well, this place is an angry place, this is a happy place, this is a productive place. Um, whether or not these inferences, this, this sentiment analysis actually does bear any resemblance with what people are actually feeling and the subjectivities that they're experiencing isn't necessarily so germane to me as the fact that people think this can be done and are building business propositions on it and that policy is being architected around it. So that's more significant to me than the question as to whether or not this stuff actually works. And if you accept my argument, if you accept the idea that tens of millions of people worldwide, at the very minimum, are already exposed to these conditions, perhaps you'll also accept my thinking that um, we probably need a new theory and, and jurisprudence even of public objects, of network public spaces, to help us guide how we think about them. Uh, and, and let me make it very clear that I do not mean a global theory or a global jurisprudence. I, I very much do mean a different reckoning for every place on earth that is trying to assess the, the value and the worth of these objects, networks, services, and so on. Uh, obviously, the jurisprudence that's appropriate, the thinking that's appropriate for Dublin might not necessarily work in Shanghai or in Lagos, and there's no reason why it should. What I'm arguing is that we, each of us, in each of the places that we call home, need to bring uh, this body of thought, this, this area of concern, to the attention, the very vivid attention of our elected representatives and our democratic systems of governance, it needs to be on the radar everywhere because this stuff is already ex uh, affecting um, the, the experience of moving through public space. And, and to, to underline that argument, I want to present to you this. I want to present uh, a taxonomy of effects, um, a series of network systems in public space, data collection systems that operate in public space. And, and I'm going to start with something that I think is um, pretty clearly something that most of us, I cannot imagine, I'll put it this way, I cannot imagine people particularly objecting to the first system that I'm going to describe to you. And then we're going to ascend through what I'm calling the spectrum of concern until we get to a system that I frankly and honestly think has no place uh, in a city that I would want to live in. And um, just possibly I will have convinced you of that by the time we get there. So this is the first system I want to talk about. This is something called the Valky traffic sensor. Um, that was uh, invented by a Finnish company. And, and this is something that, it's a bolt-on motion detector. Uh, it lives on traffic poles. Um, and it's no accident this has been designed by a Finnish company. I, I spent uh, two years of my life in Finland, and, and there's a lot that I could say about it that's positive. But one thing I will tell you about it is that it was dark and cold roughly 96% of the time. Um, and so there's an issue, especially in the north of Finland, especially up by the Arctic Circle where it's, you know, cold and dark, you know, 22 months of the year, um, there's an issue of traffic safety. There's an issue that, that uh, certainly pedestrians and bicyclists, um, visibility is very much an issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So a Finnish company called Havaina uh, invented the, this, this traffic sensor. And, and all this is, is a motion detector that's fused with some very, very bright LEDs. 
and it's bolted onto a pole and, and it's kind of locally networked. Um, you know, all of the four poles in an intersection would be talking with one another over a local area radio network. And uh, as it detects the, the uh, presence of an oncoming pedestrian or, or bicyclist, it merely lights those LEDs up and shines that into the face of oncoming traffic. Um, hopefully not in such a way as to blind them, just merely to, uh, to indicate that there's something there that you might want to be aware of. And why do I think this is an unobjectionable system? Well, there's a couple of criteria that I apply to this. The first and, and, and overwhelmingly obvious one is that there's a clear public good associated with this deployment of information gathering technology. Uh, you, if you are of an uncharitable cast of mind, you might be inclined to make an ROI argument against this. You might be inclined to ask, well, you know, really, you know, we're going to spend X million euros on deploying these sensors, and, and, you know, is there a return on that investment? Let me tell you, if it's your life or your child's life or your grandmother's life that's saved by one of these things, that ROI calculation goes out the door. Nevertheless, uh, I think most of us agree that traffic safety is something that we wish to uphold in our communities. Importantly as well, um, the information that's gathered by this device, by this system, is local. It never really leaves the local area. It expires from the world immediately. It's not harvested by any other system. There's no inferential operation that's performed on it. It's not databased. It's not archived. It's not gathered. Um, it merely indicates the, the presence or the absence of a real-time condition, and, and that's all it does. And so I would argue that this is essentially as innocuous a collection of information from public space as you could possibly ask for. But then we ascend the, the spectrum a little bit. This is something that I saw in South Korea. This is a, a, an advertisement that was in the metro system, in the subway system in Seoul. Um, and it's ostensibly uh, designed, I suppose, to make you feel like uh, you're, you're a celebrity or a superstar walking uh, the red carpet at, at Cannes and uh, that the paparazzi are chasing you. What this is, um, there's been a red carpet that's been rolled down the hallway of the subway station and uh, there's motion detectors embedded underneath it and as you pass over the motion detector and register your presence, um, the otherwise conventional paparazzi in the light box advertisement behind you, their flashes all go off and it's supposed to make you feel special. And uh, I think we can see from the expression of the gentleman in this picture that it doesn't necessarily operate uh, particularly effectively in that register. I would actually argue this is, is a disruptive and, and fairly disrespectful intervention into public space. But that's probably the worst thing that you can say about it. I mean, I will argue that it, it I, I, I cannot imagine for the life of me how this sells Nikon cameras. Um, and so yes, it's a waste. Um, but, but really the interruption um, into one's ability to operate freely in public space is not particularly significant, it's momentary. Um, and depending on what you think about advertising, advertising does that already anyway. So given that, again, this is merely a local response to a local pattern of fact, it's not gathered, it's not archived, it's not, there's no analytics that are performed on it, um, it doesn't have that gloss of a socially beneficial function that would give a, uh, the, my, you know, my ultimate kind of good housekeeping seal of approval. But it's really, it's not that particularly worrisome to me. And I think that this is the kind of thing that we can accept or, or reject in our communities based on, on um, our feelings about the commercialization of public space, but there's nothing inherently about this as a networked artifact that makes it particularly troublesome to me or worth regulating. Uh, then we get to this. This is interesting. This is a uh, network vending machine called Akure, which was deployed in Tokyo last year, uh, and this made the rounds of all of the gadget sites. Everybody was fascinated by this. I guess primarily because the entire front surface of the vending machine is a gigantic touchscreen monitor with extremely high resolution imagery on it. Um, but the interesting thing about the Akade is that it has a camera and, and other sensors that are built into it and it attempts to determine some things about the person using it, um, notably age and gender. And then it tailors the selection of beverages that are, that are on sale um, to a model uh, an inherent demographic segmentation model that lives on board and is updated in real time um, as to what if you are a 24 year old woman you're likely to want to drink and what if you are a 43 year old man you're likely to want to drink and frankly I have a problem with that um, I have a problem with the idea that uh, there's something that I ought to want based on my demographic profile maybe I'm just a, a particularly ornery kind of person but I don't like 
uh, being assessed for my age and gender and told that, you know, it's five o'clock in the afternoon and most men uh, my age at this time of day want a beer, um, it just raises my hackles. It's not something that I'm particularly comfortable with. And I don't think that there's, again, you know, any kind of socially progressive or, or productive value associated with this. The thing that does concern me about this is that the information is drawn off of the sensing mechanism. The information is networked. It is archived. It not merely constrains the offerings of every other vending machine in the Akure network. So my choice, my interaction with this machine here and now frames the potential choices that other people make around across Tokyo with the vending machines that they're encountering. It even begins to feed back into the supply chain. It even begins to feed back into what sorts of, of beverages are produced and marketed in particular regions, what sorts of things companies wish to offer to people. Is this um, potentially an efficiency that, that is enjoyed by the commercial community? I, I guess you could argue it is, but only at the cost of, of this rather um, prescriptive and, and wildly normative framing of who I am as a person and how I'm interacting with something, which is again nominally in public space. Um, a lot of people think this is just fine, and it's not for me to tell them that it isn't. I'm just telling you what my particular reaction is to it. I, I, I think that um, a lot of people have argued to me that, yeah, this actually would save me a lot of time, and, and uh, you know, choice is overwhelming after all, and really, why can't I use that information about what other people like me have, um, have chosen? And, and I guess my only um, pushback against that is that my own understanding of what a city is for has been uh, informed by a guy named Richard Sennett, and a book that was written in 1969 called The Use of Disorder. Um, the idea being that the, the whole point and the function of a great city is to expose us to registers of difference and to begin to surround us with interfaces against which we need to negotiate uh, the lack of commonality between ourselves and the world around us. The, the creation of a metropolitan self ultimately is bound up in our ability to negotiate difference. So by wrapping this mantle of comfort around us and all of our in interactions in public space by ultimately tailoring things so that they are precisely what somebody like me wants, um, I would argue that we're losing something. But we're losing something, uh, we're not nearly losing as much as we do in, in this interaction. And this is something that, that currently stands at the far end of the spectrum of concern that I wish to discuss with you. This is a screenshot from a French analytic software. Uh, the company that provides it is called Kividi, which is appropriate enough as that is Latin for he who watches. Um, Kividi provides something called Vidi Reports. It's an analytics package, as I said. Uh, this is designed for deploy uh, on a video billboard. And so there will be a camera um, around the size of the one in your mobile phone buried in the frame of the video billboard. And as people move before the frame of the billboard, uh, their image is captured and the imagery stream is subjected to analytics, which attempt to determine, again, um, age gender, ethnicity, by looking at an index of 80 facial bone characteristics, the Kaviti report system claims to be able to specify your ethnicity and, and, um, and even something that they call a, a, a glance counter, which is an attention metric. It bounces light off of your eyeballs and depending on the index of reflectivity of that light as it's received, uh, Kaviti claims to be able to tell whether you're paying attention to the video content or not. Now, why this is problematic to me has a lot to do, again, with that sort of demographic segmentation model. Because as it turns out, all of our attention is not equally uh, worthy in the mind of an advertiser. Our, our attentions have differential value. As a man in my 40s, I'm already beginning to slip away from the absolute peak maximum value for attention, which in many cultures, it, the grandeur lives with um, privileged men between the ages of 18 and 34. Um, if you happen to be lucky enough to be in that demographic, congratulations, because that is what advertising, uh, you are the target that most advertising is trying to reach in a city center. And there's a feedback loop that gets entrained by way of which the more the advertiser knows about the people moving in front of the ad, the more it knows about what reliably entrains their attention and layered against this inherent um, differential evaluation of attention, we see that the imagery on the screens will, over time, begin to be tuned exclusively to those things that we know can be relied upon to capture the attention of an 18 to 34 year old man. I don't think I need to elaborate what that's going to look like. Um, particularly as, as laser eye tracking uh, begins to, to narrow down even the region of the screen that is attended to, uh, the feedback loop gets ever tighter. I think we can all imagine what that looks like. 
Uh, the thing that, that really bothers me about Kaviti is that um, I regard it as nothing less than a theft of value from public space. And here's the reason. There will be people moving through the background um, that do not attend to the content on the screen, do not want to attend to the content on the screen, want to have nothing to do with the screen. Um, and they are providing value for the advertiser whether they know it or not. As a matter of fact, whether you're aware that the screen is doing this or not, whether anybody has ever asked you for your consent or not, and believe me, they don't ask for your consent, um, information is being gathered from you without your awareness that's of commercial value to somebody else. And that value is never returned to the public. That value is never brought back to the public realm, to the public body that, after all, creates the infrastructure and provides the public way to the citizenry, to the citizenship. It's never brought back to us. You're generating something of pecuniary value, and you're not offered a share in that. So troubling on many levels. What's particularly troubling to me, though, is that uh, we're getting to a point where we can do uh, fairly reliable uh, facial pattern matching and, and recognition. Um, and cities for, for thousands of years have relied on the notion of anonymity in public space, that, that you're effectively in a large crowd um, you can have a, a reasonable presumption that you're not identifiable as an individual or accountable as an individual. And as a matter of fact, many of our notions of public assembly and free speech uh, have relied upon that. Well, it, when you're in an era in which there's a camera that's mountable in public space that's capable of gathering this kind of information that you don't know is there, that nobody has asked for your consent as to whether it, it can gather information about you or not, and it's capable of identifying you as a specific individual person, uh, that begins to erode a lot of the conventions that our notions of the public sphere have been built around. It's easy enough to think of these things um, and, and even to begin to articulate some kind of argument about what we should do about them because they're discrete systems, they're discrete objects. But something that makes, uh, and I'm going to wrap things up, I'm, I'm aware that I'm already running over 20 minutes, um, something that makes things even harder to consider is when power knowledge like this resides not merely in one concrete object, but in an ensemble of related or networked things. This is a networked bollard in Barcelona that my wife and I saw when we were doing a walk shop there, which is a kind of a walking tour about the networked city. Um, the power that this ensemble has isn't really inherent to any one of the objects on the screen. It actually inheres in all of them in the, in the way that they work together as a functional uh, assemblage. There, there is, of course, the bollard itself, but there's also an RFID. Uh, the stanchion over there has an RFID card system on it. There's a, there's a keypad on it, and it even extends to that barrier you see in the background, and, and to the lighting, and to the signage, and to the system of laws that's erected around this, and even to the wording on the signs. All of these things together are a functional ensemble, and it can be difficult to pick out how you, uh, how you specify, how you articulate, how you regulate around an ensemble like this. It's not one thing. It's not something that can be turned on or off. It has a complicated region of effect, and it's, it's produced by a complicated sort of assortment of objects and services. Um, but it's even more troubling when, as is very often the case, power knowledge resides in code. This is something that uh, when we did a workshop in Wellington, New Zealand, um, a story was told to us about the, uh, the surveillance cameras, the CCTV cameras that ring the city center. They, when they were first installed, they were put to a public referendum. And the people of Wellington were asked, do you want these cameras to be installed in your city? And, and the logic that they were offered, the apparatus of justification, was that they were there for traffic safety and traffic management, which, again, clear public good associated with that. And based on that argument, uh, the people of Wellington said, yes, this is something. This is a system that we want in our city. The cameras were installed. And then something really interesting happened. The year after that, a new back-end management, uh, image stream management protocol, new software, became available for those cameras. Um, and this one permitted facial recognition. And so the, the cameras, the same physical objects that had been primarily beneficial and used for the advancement of everybody collectively before, uh, now began to be used by the police um, to manage uh, subjects of interest moving through the downtown area. And this was a radical transformation of the capability of the device, but it was never put to a public referendum. And even I, who argue and have argued for the idea that there should be democratic accountability over these systems, um, if, you know, if you're familiar with anything uh, about software development, you know that we now live in what's called a nightly build culture, which is to say that 
the capability of software advances on a very, very fast clock speed. New releases, new versions of things are released all the time and pushed to users. Um, and I find it very, very hard to imagine a circumstance in which the functional capability that is inherent in new versioning of software is put to a democratic referendum every single time something new is released. It's an absurdity. I mean, if you're releasing new capabilities for the same old hardware on a weekly basis, you know, what are you going to do? Have a citizen referendum every week? I, I just simply can't imagine that happening. And yet, that's almost what you need if you're able, if you if you want to maintain democratic accountability over the competency and the capability of the ensemble of linked systems to regulate behavior in public space. I didn't want to leave it there because I actually have um, some fairly robust prescriptions about how we could begin to think about these things, how we could begin thinking about defining them and, and how we might manage them. Um, and unfortunately, um, I'm at 25 minutes now and I think that we're probably gonna wrap things up um, which is really frustrating because all of this stuff is, is pretty interesting and, and pretty tasty. Um, I do want to raise some, some issues, objections, and implications around all this. I, I do want to say that, that when one does network a city, when it's robustly instrumented, when there's a lot of, of information collection going on, um, you inherently have the risk of, of what's called an increased attack surface. An attack surface is jargon that hackers and, and, and uh, crackers use to describe the, the scope of vulnerability that's available to them in their desire to exploit a surface. And, and I think that um, it is certainly the case that the network city, particularly if you've got open APIs, if you've got open application programming interfaces, um, having to do with a lot of the, the city's own inherent infrastructural systems, um, there is inherent potential scope for vulnerability and exploit that did not exist before. Um, nevertheless, I would argue that the socially positive and beneficial aspects of a lot of this technology, the, the benefits that we have to find in it, and you'll see in a service like Dublink, if you, if you uh, visit that at dublink.ie, um, the benefit is so overwhelming that it's worth assuming this sort of risk. Uh, again, this isn't something that you should accept or take my word for. This is something that each local community is gonna have to come to uh, a decision on for itself. I would argue that we haven't yet really, I mean, we've been living with the automobile for 100 years, Excuse me, and we're just now beginning to have really uh, robust etiquettes and protocols of precedence and deconfliction in the use of public space around that. We don't have any such etiquettes and protocols for behavior around networked object. Um, but I, I would argue that there is a, a potential in opening up all of these frameworks and opening up all of these systems, as I, I, I would have argued in detail. Um, we can move against the capture of public space by private interest, which is something that's personally very important to me, and, and towards a fabric of freely discoverable, addressable, queryable, and scriptable urban resources that we could all of us as citizens and as members of a community use um, to bring the entire way that we city, the entire way that we do place a little bit closer to our aspirations and our ambitions for it, toward a place where what Henri Lefebvre called the right to the city is meaningfully underwritten by the design of public space and the things in it. And finally, towards a revitalized physical manifestation of the public sphere, which I regard as, as the place where democracy happens and is seen to happen. Uh, and I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. So we want, I guess, the other speakers up on stage and then we'll do the Q&A or? Yeah, okay. So um, uh, we're just going to ask um, Ali and Connor to come up on stage. I'm not networked into the audience, but I have a feeling that they may want to, to have heard more um, about what you're going to say anyway. So I'm sure um, we'll give you some ample opportunity to, to, to get into that. Um, I suppose just to, to open it up, we really want this to be a very open discussion, so you know, um, plenty of questions from the audience. But um, I guess from from just from the beginning, I'd be interested to hear kind of Ali and Connor's um, input on on what Adam was saying and what he was sort of setting out as as uh, from the sort of very beginning to potentially, you know where this could go and what that means for public spaces um, in terms of data and how it's used. Particularly that idea about how do you prevent these private interests taking over this space. Um, Connor or Ali? Uh, yep. No. Yeah, should be up there now. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, there was so much to take in on the, what you were saying, but there's kind of a few things I'd, I'd like to kind of raise with it. And I know that you had to cut it short. And one of these things is that when it's presented in that way, it seems to be that you get into a kind of a, and I know I do this myself, this kind of oppositional stance where you're, you, you seem to be kind of, uh, there doesn't seem to be a way around these problems. And I'm wondering, you know, in what way ha have you thought about this and have you thought about the ways that you can actually, you know, without just saying no, without just like, switching and disconnecting from it and, you know, going off grid and things like this, how do you actually contest this in, in a kind of a meaningful way? And then can I add one more in? I'm also interested in, you talked about the proximate future at one point, and uh, that's, that's this idea, I think it was uh, Bell and Dorish came up with it in a paper, and it's this idea that, you know, certain things, and they're talking about ubiquitous computing, certain things are always just around the corner. It's like the future is just there, but it's not quite there yet. And there's this idea that uh, we don't recognize the future when it's here, because it doesn't look like what we imagined it would be when we were thinking about the future. And in some ways, kind of ubiquitous computing is a bit like that. And I'm wondering, since your, I know I'm going on a bit now, but since your book Everywhere, which is, I mean, I glanced over it today again. It's been a while since I read it. But how, how has the way that ubiquitous computing and pervasive computing and all the various names for it, how has it unfolded since when you wrote, you wrote that book, what, 2006? And in what ways is it, do you think it's as you predicted? In what ways is it like you predicted? But different, if you know what I mean. Sure thing. Well, that, I mean, that's a great, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a great set of questions. Thank you. Um, let me start with the, with the second question. Um, I don't actually speak of ubiquitous computing anymore. Uh, I, I, I now think of everyday life. And I simply, um, what I was arguing in that book that I wrote in 2005 was that uh, we were seeing the colonization of, of the relations, objects, and spaces of everyday life by information technology, by information processing. And while it did not actually occur in precisely the way that I argued that it probably would in the book, I think that it has happened. Um, it's undeniable. The evidence of it is everywhere around us. And as a matter of fact, that's why I didn't speak of any prospective systems at all in the talk today, but in, in four things which are deployed and active now in the communities that, that we inhabit. Um, I, I no longer speak of ubiquitous computing. I don't talk about anything that, that might take place or could take place. I talk about things which are, are actually observably, empirically happening. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I think that that just allows us to have uh, um, a different kind of conversation. Um, we don't need to be uh, as afraid of things, um, but we also don't get as, as bound up in our hopes. And we, we in, instead, it kind of holds our feet to, to the floor and forces us to reckon with things as they are. Um, at least as they are in, in certain places. Um, and I'm just more comfortable with that. I, I've gotten out of the prognostification and, and coinage business. It's just not so interesting to me anymore. I'd rather address situations that people find themselves in. The, the first question, though, I, I, I owe you all an apology, um, which has to do with, this happens to me every single time I, I, I approach these ideas. It, the audience never quite knows whether it's going to get happy at them or sad at them. Um, th this is such an incredibly nuanced conversation that if, if I was to present the entire panoply of implications of all of it, I'd be boring you to tears. We'd be here for three hours. I mean, you'd have to send out for food and, and uh, it, would be, it, just, it wouldn't be pretty. Um, as it happens, the conversation that we had this morning at the Doubling launch was about benefits and opportunities and, and hopes. Um, it was about the, the positive potentials that are inherent in all of this. I don't mean to be um, oppositional or contrarian or, or frame things negatively, but it just so happens that this is what you have to account for if you want to realize those potentials, that, that these are the things that you have to address if you want to realize the kinds of opportunities and benefits that, that I do believe are very strongly inherent in these technologies. You have to account for these other issues. And, and either conversation on its own is incomplete, and potentially, I'm not accusing any one particular individual or institution of this, but potentially even dishonest, because it's a nuanced situation, um, highly variable, highly open to, to uh, local interpretation. And, and that's why I do argue so strongly for each 
particular community beginning to discuss these issues amongst themselves and find out what the balance is that they want to find with this class of technologies, how they want to use it. Um, and that's why I'm so encouraged by what's going on here. Thanks, Adam. Um, Ali, in terms of, I mean, there's, I know there's a lot of people from Dublin here today as well. It, what, what Adam and Connor are discussing, how does that feed into what you're thinking about in terms of how Dublin City Council is progressing, particularly with the open data and in terms of, I suppose, linking it in as well to the sort of design capital and Dublin as a design? And um, well, I'd actually prefer if the people who are expert in <laughs> Dublin to talk about Dublin. But yeah. I mean, very uh, uh, basically, it's it's the city council acknowledging that we have a valuable resource, we have information, and that if we make that information available, clever, creative, sparky people out there may find very useful ways of creating something new and useful with that information. I mean, that's what it's about. It's about de developing, allowing, facilitating collaboration uh, to happen. But uh, I'm sure if, if uh, others can talk in more detail about what Dublin is about. I mean, my uh, general, uh, very quick reaction to what Adam is, has been speaking about is, A, I thought that, uh, I thought that installation in, uh, in New York was a piece of art. <laughs> the, uh, the yeah, building. it is now. It, it is now, is it? Yeah, because it looked quite, and, and then so I was disappointed when you when you said it was it was a failure, and the, <laughs> but because it's that kind of we talked yesterday but yesterday about how we don't want to iron out disruptions in the city, but uh, the other thing I, I thought I, I I'm with you all the way on 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 being contrary. I mean I'm somebody who has always flatly refuse to accept a loyalty card of any description because I just, why? Uh, but yet lots and lots and lots of other people are very happy to do that. So uh, it's probably also, it is a question of scale, I mean this networking, because while we might be very comfortable with the notion that a local shop owner might actually have, I mean back to your, your vending machine and whatever, that the local shop owner might immediately know what you want when you walk in the door, or the chemist might know exactly what you need. You, oh, you're looking for such and such, aren't you? Whereas you wouldn't, um, because I know you're, you've got that problem, uh, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't, one wouldn't be as comfortable with a large uh, chemist like Boots having that information so that when you walk in the door, everybody selling the stuff knows you have that problem. So it is a question of degree. So. What's changed? Seems so, to be so this I is think always with us. It's great. It's a great question. Uh, I think of, of your local chemist. You know, they they actually know a lot more about you than than the corporation does. But it's a question of accountability, recourse, and reciprocity, because you exist in a web of relations with your local chemist. If you live in a neighborhood, you've been going into your corner chemist for twenty years. Sure, you know they, they presumably know quite a bit about your physical ailments and probably also a little bit about you know your family and your relationships and the way in which you exist in the community, but equally you know that about them as well, and you have um, some ability uh, to hold them accountable for that action. You exist in uh, a, a world in which there are social sanctions that you can apply to them should they violate your trust, should they step outside of that relationship. You can certainly p uh, punish them by withdrawing your custom. The thing about the, the large corporation and the abstract database is that um, there's no accountability, there's no reciprocity, you're not aware even necessarily that they're gathering that information about you. You don't know how to go about getting access to it should you become aware that it's being gathered. Um, you don't know exactly what entity is holding that information. And most worrisomely of all, we know that the porosity uh, the securability of these databases is highly subject to question. That uh, I, I quoted yesterday in my discussions with City Council, the, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada has this great little slogan that they use. They say, if you can't protect it, don't collect it. And what they basically mean is don't gather information if you're not able to guarantee that you are the ultimate um, accountable party and that you're going to maintain control over that information forever after. What we've seen time and time again is that whether it's a public body or a corporate body, private sector body, that gathers the information, over time they lose control of it. Over time another party comes to power. Over time you know, a merger or an acquisition takes place and, and that database 
is part of, um, you know, it's, it's a line item asset in an acquisition. It becomes the property of, of another party that you might have authorized the collection of information by a small chain, by a Dublin-based company. What happens when the Dublin-based company or the Ireland-based company is bought by an American conglomerate? You know, are you, are you comfortable with that? It's not just what happens here and now with all of this information, it's that it persists. It never leaves the world. And it tends to slip around the systems of, of containment and accountability that we've erected around it. Connor, do you have some? I'll just add a little bit to that. And I think as well, it's, it's a question of transparency. I mean, with your local chemist, you know what they know. You have a fair idea because, you know, it's been a one-to-one -one relationship you, 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 that you've built up. So there is a certain thing that it's not so bad that they, they have the information, but it's, it's knowing what information do people have, why do they have it, how do they get it. Uh, I mean, I got a letter today from my bank manager saying, you know, now that you're, you're uh, self-employed, you know, you might want to think about your pension. I think, yeah, I'm not self-employed. <laughs> but it's just this, this, this idea that, you know, he, he pulled out some information about me which I couldn't figure out how he got it, and it was kind of annoying. So, you know, I have to think, now do I ring him up and say, how do you know that? And, you know, it's wrong, but how do you know it anyway? Not that, I, not that I'm going to tell you it's wrong so you can crack that database. But it's all this idea of transparency and how, uh, how much information do people know about you? Uh, where do they get it and how can you see it? And can you, can you also, can you erase it? Can you, can you correct it, uh, modify it and say, well, you know, I'm happy with you having that, but not that. And that's the, I mean, I guess that kind of comes into the doubling thing. And I mean, this morning was very positive and it was very, uh, and this whole idea that, you know, the city is putting out data that they collect on people and you can kind of see its usefulness and its utility. And uh, so in that way, that's, that's more of kind of what I was trying to get at. Maybe I pushed too much, but how, how, do you, how do you use these systems and how do you use this technology to actually do something that you're, you're very happy with and that will actually enhance our lives in some way rather than being something that we're concerned about all the time and that we kind of, we get backed into this position where we're saying we don't like that kind of stuff and down with that kind of thing. And we'd rather say, no, no, we'd, we'd just like to see it doing something else, but we, we like the idea of this technology. That was all in the bit of the presentation that I had to rush over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I mean, there, there is, I, I obviously, I don't know if it's obvious, I, I do have some fairly concrete propositions and proposals as to, about, as to how we might change the balance a little bit and make it more likely that the things that we want to have happen around this data and around these systems do happen and the things that we're concerned about uh, become rather less likely. I, I would argue though, and I guess I would as, as you know, the, the managing director of a company that does this, so you should take anything I say on the subject with a grain of salt, but um, I, I think it's a design question. I think it comes down to the, the, um, the care and the craft with which these systems and their interfaces are designed. Uh, and uh, it is certainly the case that, uh, so, so you know, you're a student of ubiquitous computing. I'll, I'll explain for the people in the room who, who may not be. Ubiquitous computing for a very long time carried in its wake uh, a discourse of seamlessness. The idea that there was this kind of effortless smooth flow between systems and that everything was going to be oriented towards your maximum convenience and that you would never need to engage focally with computing machinery and, and with uh, the sorts of interactions that have characterized the computing in, in the past, that as information processing itself begins to characterize more and more of the world that we engage, it has this kind of quality of effortlessness or even magic to it. And, and one of the things that I've very strongly argued um, is that that's a profoundly disempowering way to go about doing things, and that uh, I don't actually believe in making things seamless. And I try not to use the word seamless in my vocabulary. I, I try instead to speak of what a guy named Mark Weiser said, uh, called uh, beautiful seams, in that we acknowledge the inherent heterogeneity of the technical systems and architectures on which these value propositions are built. We design seams into them, not as moments of interruption and discontinuity and discomfort, but simply to give people access and understanding, allowing them to build a mental model of the way in which the system has its effect in the world. A very good, simple, concrete example of this um, for people who are familiar with the web. Um, in the very early days of the web, every browser had something called view source available in it. You could look at a web page 
and select the view source command and see the HTML directly, see the way in which the page was constructed, the way in which the, the page did what it did. And if you were of that kind of mind, you could deconstruct, analyze, you could learn how to make a web page. At that point in time, HTML was simple enough that a lot of people who had no background or affinity or, or thought they had no affinity for technology at all actually became web designers, web developers, launched themselves on careers um, you know, that, that were actually fairly remunerative and fairly productive simply because of the existence that that command, the, the existence of the view source command and the ability it gave them to reach into this technical system and understand a little bit about how it worked, to begin building a mental model about how it worked. Um, and what I would argue is that we absolutely need to build things like view source into things like dub linked. And, and what that would mean um, is, is it gets a little bit arcane. It, it comes down to a question of what's called metadata. Metadata is information about information. So that the site, the, the repository doesn't just offer you, um, you know, this is traffic flow or these are air quality readings, but um, exactly how, uh, you know, how those uh, characterize that information set, how is it gathered, who gathered it, who made the choice to gather it in that way, where were the sensors located, who made those sensors. You know, the more, the, the, the deeper you can reach into a complex network system, and I'm not arguing that everybody can or should want to do this, but we need to offer people the ability to do this so they can begin to gain some kind of control over it. And, and that's all in the part that we went by like a lightning shot, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I might, Ali, did you want to say or we might? No, I, don't, I, I just yeah. think it's amazing the way you um, connect all this back to the physical. Makes it so much easier to understand for me. <laughs> I agree with Ali. <laughs> it's easier to understand for me as well. Um, what I might just do now is I'll open it out to the audience. I'm sure a lot of people have questions. We have Ian who's going around with the mic. He's at the back. So if you want to raise your hand and Ian will make his way to you. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm also a researcher in ubiquitous computing and privacy. And as somebody who designs technologies and works with others who do and teaches students how to do this, we all know that technologies become fairly obdurate once they're in place. So the kinds of interventions you're talking about have to be done in when we're thinking about them, because that's when we, the individuals, have the most power. Could you please talk about how to address that part? Oh, goodness. Um, first off, I, I, I want to absolutely underwrite, uh, underline, applaud, and celebrate everything you've said. It's absolutely true. The, the obduracy is something that crops up quite a lot. And what we mean by that, especially as regards public space, um, something that's installed in the street tends to remain in the street. I, I'll limit my discussion of obduracy to this very physical, salient uh, quality of things. Um, if you, uh, so my wife and I do these things that are called walk shops. And these are like 90 minute walking tours of various cities around the world where we take people, groups of up to about 25, and we look at instrumented public space and we look at the public way and the public realm. And we ask how the things that are there got there uh, and what they do and what kinds of, of potentials they have. And one of the things that we cannot help but notice is that the streetscape is filled with technologies that no longer serve their original purpose. It's filled with, with installations that no longer have any definable purpose at all, at least instrumentally. So you, know, you can look at, at a New York City street and you can see that there are um, police and fire call boxes which were disconnected years ago and are no longer of any particular utility, but they're there. And you can look at um, old post boxes which may have been, you know, the, the, the postal service has cut back um, their operations and they no longer, you know, they haven't collected mail excuse me, from this location since 1983, and yet the post box stays there. Um, there are all sorts of things in the public realm which have an astonishing longevity and continue to have agency and to continue to, to impact the ways in which people use public space for years after their instrumental qualities have sort of absconded and evaporated off of them. So it is absolutely the case that as we layer another um, another layering of, of technology and, and, and objects and physical interventions onto the streetscape um, that we think about the longer term. And it's particularly the case because network technology evolves at a speed that is much, much faster than place does. Uh, you know, Stuart Brand in his book, How Buildings Learned, years and years ago, 
uh, shared the diagram that, that Frank Duffy, I guess, had originally drawn. It's called the, 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 uh, the shearing layer diagram or the pace layering diagram. And the idea was that a house uh, has, has different layers and they evolve at different speeds. So a house is built on a geological site that evolves uh, only very, very slowly, if at all, over time. And there was an increasingly fine-grained series of layers within the house, uh, ranging from like the skin to the structure to the, the services within to the stuff that lived in the house. And these evolved at a faster and faster speed. And the stuff, as a matter of fact, moves in the house you know, on an hourly basis. And, and I would add that there's a social layer as well that, that's, that's bound up with us physically and how we move through the world. Um, that obviously evolves in, in real time. And the mistake that Duffy and that Brand were arguing is made by architects very often is to pin things from, that, that should be uh, at the faster layers into the slower layers. So they're harder to access, they're harder to maintain, they're harder to remove should there become a necessity to remove them. And this is absolutely the case in public space. That we begin, you know, we see the value proposition involved in putting up, um, you know, cellular transmission towers or something like that. And we invest quite a lot of money and time and legal effort and, and uh, you know, community board approval in putting these towers in place, regardless of the idea that these things might only have an operational service lifetime that's measured in months. I mean, technology, information technology moves so very fast and we are placing things in the landscape that we know from experience are likely to be there 20, 30, 50, 100 years. Um, and there's just an inherent disconnect between these two things. How do we begin addressing this issue? Well, I'm in my old age a great believer in democratic accountability and in, in representative government. It used to be that I was somewhat more of a direct action type myself, but I guess I kind of aged out of that a little bit. Um, so I believe that we really do need to bring these, these issues to the attention of our elected representatives. We need to bring them uh, into public debate. We need to make them uh, issues that people can be found accountable for uh, at the ballot box. And I, I have to tell you, these issues are on almost nobody's radar. You know, this is not really seen as a bread and butter issue for citizens anywhere yet. Um, but hopefully, if I've instilled one thought in you, it's that they might be in the near future and, and in fact, in many ways already are, and that we ought to be voting what we think about these things. I hope that's a satisfactory answer. I've been long-winded. I'm sorry. Um. Just following on on that one very quickly, um, Connor, you spoke about transparency and it uh, kind of connects in with what Adam is saying. I mean, your work, Namaland, was very interesting from the point of view that it was talking about something that everybody was really discussing at a particular time, but that it didn't really have any visible manifestation. And I, I wonder about what you sort of think about the role that artists can play, like, you know, Science Gallery working up to hack the city and so on, but the role that you could, that we can play in actually visualizing some of the aspects of what Adam is talking about, of these potential futures that we don't yet know of these technologies and how they're going to be used and putting it out there so that people can actually start discussing them or using it as a platform. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's, that's very interesting because just to talk about Namaland, which was this uh, an augmented reality uh, app for the phone, but what it did was it used it was kind of like it was like what you would do with open data if you had it. And of course, the data. The problem with Nama was that there was no data; it was all secret. It was exempted from the, the all the properties that were in Nama were exempted from the from the Freedom of Information Act, so you couldn't get this information. But someone had a website where they collated this information from public sources and you know, they put a huge amount of work building up basically a spreadsheet of everything that they'd, they'd seen reported in the newspapers and media anyway and made this list of what properties they assumed were in NAMA and with, with a kind of a documentary proof of what, why they put this, doc, this property in. Can I, can I interrupt you for a second? Because sorry. I just realized what you were talking about. Um, and I just oh, go with them on the Can you, is there any, every, does everybody know what that means? Because I didn't. Yeah, sorry, I'll explain. Should I explain Nama to you? Or? It, it, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a New Yorker, banks, I don't, you know. Okay, Irish banks went bust. They put all their money in property loans. The property loans, the property market crashed. These loans were worthless. Irish government stepped in said, we'll buy those loans off, off you to take them off the books, and in the same time, assume them into public ownership. Uh, the rest is history, you know, country bankrupt effectively. 
but at the same time, there's this huge data, there's this huge kind of portfolio property owned by NAMA or controlled by NAMA. Can't say owned, uh, but we don't, we didn't know what it was. So I was able to get this database that someone had put together, uh, geotag it kind of really, which means just find it where it is in longitude and latitude, so you can actually use it in, on a phone, and painstakingly, like literally going from place to place, and it. The list was something like the property on such and such a street, and I'd go down and say, that's the NAMA property, or the site in such and such a street, and I'd look at where the hoarding was, was the site. So it's kind of manually doing this, and then made this database, which then put this overlay, this little monopoly man figure over all these things and gave you a little bit of information about it. And one of the things that has, that has actually done is that the debate now, the pressure has been on NAMA to, to start releasing data, and they have actually started releasing the data. And you know, I'm not saying it is all down to me, but once people got this and they started visualizing it, it became, it went from there being this very abstract thing that was kind of dull and boring, oh yeah, NAM owns lots of properties, to you know, NAM owns that property, NAM owns yeah. that shopping center. Oh my God, what's gone wrong? That it, it, became became, very it became very physical. It became very physical, physical very yeah. concrete, and very much on the streets. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's the power of visualization. I think Ali wants to... Um, yeah. No, just to say, I, th I think people only really, really understand that information is power when they don't have the information. That's the absence of information. I mean, w one thing, well, one, say, aspect of information Dublink isn't releasing, obviously, is lots and lots of personal information about people on our social housing list and our tenants. You know, so that's, you know, so drawing, drawing boundaries. But, um, yes, uh, well done with your, <laughs> your, your app. <laughs> Um, just, I might just open it out. Um, there's a question there, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to something that Adam said. Um, but first, Connor, you'd be pleased to know that Namaland has actually accompanied me on many a Sunday walk to go around and find Namid properties. <laughs> um, not everyone has the same hobbies as I do, but um, but but actually to go back to, I mean, we we are technology is, is progressing at a pace that is unprecedented. But one of the things that I think we want to, and I'm not saying that you're ignoring this, but like the idea of obsolete technologies kind of giving cities their texture, you know, the phone boxes that are disappearing, the, um, the post boxes in Ireland that have the royal symbols on them that are just painted green. I mean, those identify the city in a photograph. You can identify a city as Dublin through, through its obsolete technology sometimes. Um, I come from an archaeological background, so to me, um, what you're talking about could easily be something archaeologists would, would engage with. And there's been uh, some debates over the, the future of our industrial heritage um, because it's not really valued. Um, and there was actually even a debate, and this one I think is quite interesting in terms of what we do with technology that has um, uh, difficult meanings behind it, was that when the peace process kicked in, removing the guard towers along the border, that some of the archaeologists were saying, well, these are our heritage, and other people were saying, it's too recent. So this idea that the relation, the tension between keeping things that have meaning, um, but not the things that are too difficult, if that makes sense. And this idea that technology, like old CCTV cameras, you know, the obsolete ones are still there. Um, should we leave them? So I, I kind of wonder sometimes, should we deliberately leave obsolete things in the landscape because we need to network in, a, in, a time, in time depth as well. Like there's nothing more disturbing than walking through a place that has, is only a single period of construction where there's nothing old, there's no way to connect. Um, so I'm just interested in what you think of, you know, what do we preserve now that, you know, 50 years ago, it wasn't as big of an issue. We, things got preserved by default um, because they just didn't get used. They got left there um, or they got taken down. But um, then what, what do we keep and what do we not keep? And how do we manage that given that once we've acknowledged something's value, um, that meaning changes again? What a beautiful point. Um, I think that there has been sort of a phase change in, in the objects that we find in public space. I mean, the idea of, of a, an imperial post box that's, that's had a layer of paint applied to it and that bears, it's kind of a palimpsest and it bears the traces of a complicated and contested history. 
um, I don't think you'll get any argument that that's something that has a validity and importance and, and is a mirror to a community of, of its Come own Come down history. to my neighborhood, you will. Yeah, okay, well, so I mean, I'm not gonna argue that point. I think it's a splendid point. I would say that, you know, we're talking about Cisco routers and LG cameras, and these things by their nature are kind of placeless. Um, they, they're extraordinarily generic. They've, they've been designed to be modular. They've, they, they've been produced at mass industrial scale. And um, I guess there's almost a romantic in me that says that, that if these technologies actually were a little bit more place specific, um, or, or, you know, that, that there would be, um, I would feel a little bit more complicated about, about their, their eventual disappearance from the landscape. I will say that, that things do take local forms. I mean, I, I'm, I may be like you. I mean, I'm, I've got some strange hobbies. One of them is when I, when I visit a city, I take pictures of the electric poles and, and the utility uh, stanchions and, and the pylons and the lampposts. And, um, you know, these things are also generic technologies, and yet I can tell, you know, maybe because I'm a complete geek, but I can look back at my photo library and I say, okay, well, that's from Seoul, and that's from Tokyo, and that's from Prague. Um, so there are ways in which these things become markers of place and, and of experience. And um, I have to agree with you that, that I would be sorry to see those things completely washed out of the landscape. I agree with you completely. There's nothing that depresses me more than, than a kind of a monoculture, a physical monoculture. It's not a place I want to spend time. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe we just come to terms with the fact that, that place is inherently a layered experience. And that, um, I guess the, the thing is, there, there are two complications. One is that the technology now does produce a new layer every 20 minutes. Um, and so it might have produced, you know, in, in the history of a thousand year occupation of a place, you might have three discrete layers that take you to, you know, 1945, and then and then 17 layers between 1945 and the present. That gets a little weird. The second thing is from a historical perspective, um, particularly with things that are wireless, particularly things that are like RFID or, or you know, effectively invisible. Um, those things characterize our use of public space and condition our use of public space the same way a post box might, or a bollard, or a traffic signal, and yet they they leave no physical trace. Uh, and I wonder what the historians of the future and the pedestrians of the future are going to make of that. They, will they be able to retrieve the way in which our experience was conditioned from our physical surroundings? And I do wonder about that. But it's it's a gorgeous perspective, and, and thanks for bringing it. Um, yeah, up in there. Thanks. Uh, just building on that last question, um, uh, as somebody's been kind of in Dublin for a few days now, and then Ali and Connor is somebody so intimately bound up with the physical nature of Dublin. Um, the last question here uh, talks about textures. And just for you, I'm just wondering, what do you kind of see as that, you know, you talk about it being local and rooted in the local environment. For you, what, what are the textures of Dublin for you? Uh, what, what here do you kind of feel is really like, that's Dublin, uh, that, kind of, that kind of hits you there, that kind of this feels, that's this place? You're on the spot, Adam. Oh, goodness. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm looking to you guys to rescue me. That's uh, oh, the scale of the place is tremendous. I mean, so the last time I was here is in 1989. And so that was the only previous time I've been here. And so I've got this lovely kind of before the boom and after the boom a, a bracket on the place. Um, there are the, the scale, uh, the light, the, the way that the, the, the streets uh, you know look when they get wet and, and the, the light sneaks under the cloud deck. I was on the bridge across O'Connell Street the other day and, and the entire sky was lidded except for the sun was kind of breaking through in the west as it was setting and it was lighting everything with this little kind of lambent sideways glow and, and it, it brought me back immediately to 1989. I mean, that was, there, there are just configurations of, of the way that light dances in the air that, that you associate with particular places. Um, but the other thing too, <laughs> I'm gonna embarrass myself. I, so we went out for a, a beer last night. We had, you know, I, I wanted to get a pint of Guinness really badly because I hadn't had one since I'd been here. Um, and I thought, I, I even tweeted to the effect, I felt like a total tool. I felt like such a tourist ordering a pint of Guinness in, in Dublin. And yet I felt that I kind of had to do that. And I mean, it was, it was sort of, uh, you know, this is where the stuff is made. And, you know, I drink uh, quite a good deal of Guinness. So I thought it was a, sort of a micro pilgrimage that we made. Um, and, and I, you know, that, despite the, the inevitable corny aspects of it, I was really grateful for the opportunity to do that, to taste something in the place in which it's made and know that you're tasting it in a way that you wouldn't be able to taste it in New York or, or in Seoul or anywhere else, to know that um, 
you know, you, th there's, there is something in Coet um, in that experience that I would argue uh, is just purely subjective and experiential and, and, and has that aura, you know, that Walter Benjamin talks about. Um, I don't know, I thought that was great. I, I felt very much here when I was drinking that pint of Guinness, I'll tell you that much. Um, can I ask Connor a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, what are you, how are you developing this uh, Namalands app? I mean, are you are you going to start? Is it just a voy voyeurism, or are you going to start connecting it up to useful other bits of information? At the moment, no. Uh, at the moment, I need to update the database, and I haven't done that. Take some off and put some more in. Uh, no, I mean, originally, I mean, I envisaged it just as it was, just as a kind of a statement that would then be temporary in nature and go away, and people would lose interest in it and forget about it, but it would make this point. And I just, I mean, it's just to get that thing out into the, and really what I, what I, what I hope will happen is that NAMA will release the data properly geotagged as a data set, and I know that they have it, because I mean, I've talked to people who says, yes, they do have it, and we're trying to get it, you know, there's people at Maynooth who are trying to get it out of them, and they know they have it, and they know they're saying, we have the, we have the software, and we will just release that, and then they'll do something, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the, the Maynooths, they have this site called Aero, it's the All-Ireland Research Observatory, and they're, 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 it's basically, you can make your own mashups of various data sets that they have there, and it's, I mean, it's really fantastic. It's fantastic work that they're doing down there. And really, that's what I hope, is that this will be kind of the, the thorn that will just really annoy them and make them, you know, people say, why, why don't we have this information? And do it in kind of a very public way that kind of embarrasses everyone involved, which I think I did. And just sort of someone else, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm an artist, it's not my job. I could, I could spend many years at this and I would lose attention. I have a very short attention span. <laughs> but, but also it's a job for someone else. It's, 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 they should release the data set and then everyone can get at it and, and, and do a better job. I think that that kind of makes the point, makes the argument for doubling really well, for makes the point for open data really well, that, that somebody is able to bring it to visibility and somebody else is able to act on it. Um, I mean, I, you know, already I can think of ways in which that visual, uh, the ability to interact with things directly and find out information about them in real time um, opens up possibilities about how you might want to offer that space up for reuse, for adaptive reuse, for short-term occupancy and for all kinds of creative reinterpretations of that space. And so that, you know, it, what it does, I think, I would argue, is that it, it takes a latent community of interest and turns it into an actual community of practice. Um, this, this sort of, the, the data itself is a social object that, that connects him and me and the city and the owner of the property and the people who might be using it and um, surfaces kind of a, a connection between us that might not have existed before. I find that very exciting. I think the work is amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, really happy to hear that it's been used as kind of a cudgel. I think it's wonderful. But um, I mean, once the data becomes available, and I, and I think it will, I'd certainly be interested in maybe getting back in. But I know that you know, in DIT, they have this, this project called Namalab. I think they're in the architectural department. And that's really interesting too. And they've kind of built on, you know, they've taken some of the information and they've done more with it. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, and I see a couple of people here who were at associated with NAMA Lab mm. in DIT, but uh, what uh, I suppose what struck me um, about our, our NAMA Labs, our NAMA Lab discussions uh, was that we need to move, we need to start being tough on ourselves and start, if, if we really do want to apply this information powerfully, is start pointing out how this, uh, these properties are um, invaluable if they are used in particular ways, to uh, to not to not adopt the attitude that these sites are there and anything can anything goes uh, is free for all, but to say no, these these sites could be uh, valuable, uh, uh, it, and if if we use them for a specific purpose which is necessary, and that's I think how your app could be developed. If it starts, if if you if if it connects with maybe. Uh, necessary, fun you know, uh, absent, absent uses, 
uh, in the locale and says, you know, do you realize this could happen here? And then people would be prompted to actually get really angry and say, why isn't it happening here? And we demand it. I'm, I'm just conscious of time, so I might just go back out to the audience. There's a gentleman there at the back. Hi, just a very quick comment. I'm I slightly overstimulated. I found it absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, I just wanted to say that this is not unconnected from the Occupy Dame Street, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy all over the place. Um, the commentators are saying that a, comp a group called Adbusters in Canada is kind of a con major contributor uh, to the idea of people putting tents outside stock exchanges because in, in basic terms, um, o overstimulation, over overselling, over consumerism, uh, the product appearing everywhere when you step into something called the public place um, is actually becoming objectionable to those groups who are gathering and it's not unconnected connected to the um, right to the city and the Lefebvian uh, theories finally coming to pass, so I was delighted to hear you mention them. And in relation to the right to the city, um, Ireland is a fascinating place for the, uh, probably the most, in my opinion, the most important philosopher and sociologist of the 20th century from France who predicted that capital would destroy specificity. Specificity is the pint of Guinness, it's the daylight on the bridge, it's all that stuff that you find here, which is being wiped. And these technologies are helping that to happen. And I, I just very briefly would say that, that in, in there somewhere, uh, there are suggestions, because the communities which can gather around these issues were previously, and have been in Ireland up to very recent generations, real communities who had parishes and churches. Uh, more and more, they're becoming virtual communities. And somewhere in there, there's something positive for moving forward if we could all recognize that we might be, in Ireland particularly, part of a previous versions of communities, but into the future, and giving this rapidly evolving technology, also part of virtual communities organized. Um, thanks. I, I think just to go straight to maybe another, there was another question straight here, and we maybe give both of those to the panel then. Um, one thing just while that's happening that I'm conscious of, a phrase that keeps coming to mind that, that is, uh, my background was, it was environmental awareness actually. I was out in Ballymun for a long time and one thing that we often talked about there was this idea of a better choice of choice. And um, I, I, yeah, it's something I've always kind of debated in my mind for a long time, but when you're talking about open data and public good and so on, is that something that comes into it as well? So I'm just gonna leave that hanging out there as well, that idea of are you sort of saying to people, you know, this is, we're providing you, is that vending machine saying here, you know, actually you're this age, you should probably have this drink, or, you know, is it that dark? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just had one question about the, um, Adam, in your presentation, you kind of present these vignettes of different um, urban kind of installations and in order of how intrusive they were kind of, and in one of them, you had um, examples from Asia, for example, the Japanese vending machine. And I was wondering how much do you think of that, your own reaction to that is more your own kind of cultural bias? Because for example, in Japan, um, you know, a lot of Japanese think blood types, for example, totally matches what your personality is gonna be like. And without making any you know, generalizations, you know, maybe in that culture, maybe it's more acceptable to do these kind of normative kind of displays of what it is like to be a uh, young female, 34, and what kind of drinks you would like. So I'm just wondering, maybe it's your own cultural values that are giving you this reaction that maybe it's actually appropriate in that kind of society. I, I agree with you up to a point. I mean, I think it's absolutely the case that I bring my own values to the conversation. I hope that I made that absolutely clear, you know, that, that, that uh, th this is simply my perspective of somebody who's from New York, who, who works in technology, who was born in 1968. I mean, this is all the case, and, and I never mean to, to muddy that issue at all. These are absolutely my cultural values and perspectives. Um, that said, I'm not gonna be a cultural relativist about prospectivity and, and, and um, normativity. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I, I worked in Japan. I lived in Japan for three years and things which I found extraordinarily intrusive and problematic, people there either didn't find problematic at all to the point that they didn't notice it or actively found it comforting, actively found themselves and their experience reflected in that to the point that um, there's probably a sense of community that, uh, you know, a 24-year-old a Japanese woman buying a beverage that is marketed to a 24-year-old Japanese woman feels that she's participating in a ritual of, uh, that, that inscribes her own identity and, and reflects that back to herself. I will bring another value of mine which, which accords with the things that the gentleman was saying previously. I would regard that as an alienated relation. I would regard that as, as um, 
something which, you know, it's not for me to say that that culture can or shouldn't or, or oughtn't do that, but it, it doesn't make me feel particularly good. And, and the thing about these technologies, which is so insidious, is that um, they, they travel in ways that I don't believe that they ought to. And I'll, I'll make it clear what I mean by that. Um, the scale at which these technologies are deployed and which they unfold in the world, uh, things which are designed in a lab in, in Palo Alto, wind up becoming the de facto way that people around the planet mediate themselves back to themselves or, or, or the experience is mediated to them. Um, there are just a couple of places on this planet that actually you know, control, and I don't mean to sound paranoid about this, but wind up conditioning the ways in which these technologies um, are deployed. So, so Bangalore is one of those places. There's a lot of systems, particularly back-end systems, that have been developed in Bangalore um, that inscribe a particular subcultural way of seeing the world. It's the way that an Indian engineer in his 30s thinks about the world, and that winds up getting inscribed in the tool that millions of people use. There's a lot of things that are made in Silicon Valley or in San Francisco by young hipsters and startup companies who inscribe their lifestyle on things. Foursquare is the personality of a single human being. It's Dennis Crowley. It's a guy I know who went to NYU, who went to ITP, who wound up inscribing his lifestyle and his personality in a tool which now tens of millions of people worldwide use. And all I ever ask is that we be conscious of that and that um, to the degree that it's possible, the there is sort of a, our savior may well be the fact that these tools are so lightweight, so easy to produce, so modular, that we can now make local versions of each one of them. Um, and yet, we still see a way in which the power and the grandeur in technology are concentrated in a very small number of physical places, in a very small number of subcultures and communities. And uh, I guess I'm just uncomfortable with the notion that something gets imposed on people willy-nilly without them understanding necessarily what that implies. Um, so I'm just conscious that we're getting to, so I might just ask for if there's a last word from Ali or from Connor that they'd like to. Um, well, given we've, we're making this, I've made this world design capital bid and um, regardless of whether we get the designation in 2014 or not, we do want to uh, continue to think hard about how we design our city and how, how we design it well. And what um, is there one particular design challenge you would urge we take, we address in, in, in your area? I think you've already discussed it. Um, I think that the idea that there are, there are derelict properties or underused and underutilized spaces in the city that have the potential to, so, I mean, it's, it's weird. You have this neat, I mean, I was at the Occupy Dame Street protests the other night. I was at a general assembly on health care. And I listened to the, the sense of grievance and, and the issues that people articulated, um, some of which were the kinds of things that you need physical platforms to resolve, that you need particular spaces in particular communities to begin to address. And on the other hand, you have the stock of, of you know, sound structures that are, that are you know, underutilized or, or abandoned. Um, and that I would think that whatever you could do technologically or otherwise, I mean, even if it's a very low-tech solution, but to begin to connect the overstock of, of physical locations with the, the human demands for those places, to begin to close that loop a little bit. I mean, that's something I'd love to see you do as part of Design Capital, because that would be a lesson for the world. It would be beautiful. Connor? Uh, just a kind of a quick word is from, I was at the Dublin uh, event this morning as well, and it just really, uh, I thought it was incredibly optimistic. I thought the council had put such, such huge effort and such, you know, the, the motivation to actually get all the data out there and to get people using it. I mean, they were even asking for people to, you know, suggest what data would you want? What what's the data would you, would you like to, to use in mashups or apps or whatever it is that you, you're going to do? And I think that's, that's, that's something that's really positive and it kind of, it offsets maybe the negative side that we've been talking about here, but there is, there is opportunities and I, I think that's, that, I mean, if that was part of the design bit as well, that would be a really fantastic thing if we could start using this data. And I mean, the thing is, I mean, I've certainly found that, you know, a little bit of data is a very powerful thing and you can really kind of change people's opinions and, and just 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 activate people people you know bring things to people's attention so that they they you can you can focus their attention on something in a kind of easy easy to easy to digest way, and I think open data is really going to 
it's going to change a lot of things in that way. Thanks so much. And I suppose just to add to that, um, I'd like to bring to everyone's attention end of October, Hack the City open call. And I suppose we're really interested, along I see Deirdre up there as well, in getting proposals in that are about using the data and about what we really want to do is to see lots of experiments happening around the city in June 2012. Um, and as Connor says, looking at the opportunities and highlighting things and actually starting the discussion and addressing the issues that Adam has brought up here today, I think that often you know, getting in there and doing it and starting that discussion would be really interesting. So um, as with all Science Gallery conversations, um, I'd like this to continue. Uh, we have uh, Science Galleries at Science Gallery on Twitter. If there was a question that you didn't get to ask, please tweet it and we will, uh, hopefully maybe Adam will be checking in and the other guys and we might continue the conversation there um, and always get in touch with us. And um, I'll just finish by saying thank you very much to the panel and thank you to you all.